Hey Bubblers, in this video we're going to learn how to build a video analysis app using Bubble, Gemini Pro from Google, and AWS Lambda. So the idea is we're going to build a Bubble app that allows our users to upload videos and then analyze them or query against them in various ways using the Gemini Pro API. So just yesterday at the time of this recording, Google has made Gemini Pro publicly available in public preview. And so now as long as you have a Google Cloud account, you can get an API key to call this model. And that opens up all kinds of new use cases where video data is important. So we're going to look at how to, to do this in, a, in the context of a bubble app um, and using some infrastructure on AWS to support it. So let's look at the overview of this talk and then we'll get into how to build things. Before we get started, if you're new here, my name is Corey McDougall. I'm the founder of Launchable AI. We're a consultancy that helps companies develop their AI strategy and launch AI products. So if you're looking for help with this sort of thing, please feel free to reach out. Okay, so here's an outline of what we're going to cover in the tutorial. First thing we're going to do is an, an overview of the architecture. So I'll draw a box and arrow diagram of the various components we need to build and wire up together to get this to work. Uh, the next thing we'll do is look at some sample code in a Colab notebook that Google has provided just to run the API and kind of see the code that we're going to be starting from. After that, we're going to take that code and port it over to Lambda functions that we can deploy on AWS. And then finally, we'll connect our, uh, a, our bubble app through API connector and API gateway on AWS so that we can um, pass our request from bubble to AWS and that will get proxied on to Google. Uh, and the reason for this I'll talk about later, um, the reason for mixing the two clouds instead of just staying on GCP, but um, we'll get into that later. Okay, so first let's sketch out the architecture that we need for this. So there's basically two paths or two APIs that we need to build. The first one is where we'll pass our videos to be processed to get the frames extracted from the video and then stored in our bubble app. The second thing that we're going to do, the second path or API is going to be for querying with that data against Gemini. So our architecture will look something like this. First, we'll have our bubble app here. I'll fill in these boxes in a minute. Um, then we're going to have our first Lambda function and API gateway, which um, is like our dispatch function for processing the video. Then we have our processor back here. Um, and this is sort of path one, let's say. So if we go from bubble to dispatch function to um, processing function, and I'll just write the text in here now. Okay, so this is sort of path number one. Our bubble app is our UI, our interface, our user facing software. Um, that will make a request to an API um, using API Gateway to expose our first Lambda function, which is a dispatch function. Uh, the reason to have these two functions instead of just one is because the video parsing can take a while and you don't want your bubble app to hang for a long time while the video is processed. What you want to do is kick off a processing job in the background and send a response back to bubble immediately to say whether it was successful or not. And then that data will be passed on to the second Lambda function, which will do the frame extraction and compiling the data structure that we need to interact with the API. And then once that's done, we'll send a message back to Bubble to tell our app that we're done. And we'll use this um, either through the workflow API or the data API in Bubble. Either one would work. Um, and so this is how we upload videos. This is step one. Step two is our Bubble app will talk to a second uh, Lambda function which does the querying against Gemini. So down here, we'll have another Lambda function. And this will be, let's say, our Lambda for querying. And uh, this will take um, basically the prompt that we want to send to the language model, as well as um, an ID of the video that we're querying against so that we can reach into our bubble database and get the data that we need. Um, so just to look ahead a little bit, um, the structure that you send over to the API for, for this uh, use case is a sort of like a JSON array, and it will be a bunch of two part uh, data objects where one part is the image URL of the frame that we're looking at, and then the timestamp of that URL. And a sequence of these represents the video as a like across time. So that will be stored in our bubble database after we extract it um, through this first pass, and then we'll have to retrieve it and send it over to Gemini. So that's this will be our query path. Um, take one of these. And then our query Lambda will actually talk to the Gemini um, API. So in theory, this part, you could write um, this querying path, you could write on GCP. Um, you could do all the logic that we're going to do on AWS in a Google Cloud function instead of a Lambda. 
Um, but just to sort of simplify things, we'll do both of our lambdas on AWS instead of mixing and matching too, too much. And here I've just filled in a little bit more detail. Um, it's API connector, as I mentioned, that will allow us to reach out from our bubble app to talk to the Lambda. And in front of the Lambda will be an API gateway, um, which is one way to access your Lambdas. There's another thing called a function URL where you can directly access your Lambda. Um, we might do that instead, we'll see. Um, and then over here, uh, same thing, API connector will be used to call out to this uh, Lambda as well. Um, and then that Lambda will talk to the Google API in the background. So this is sort of the structure of what we're building. Um, architecturally, it's not too complicated, um, but it requires a bit of code and infrastructure. So it's a, it's sort of on the intermediate level. Um, if you're new to Bubble, this might be a lot. If you've never programmed before, it might be a lot. But um, if you have a little bit of experience with both, uh, it's not too bad. And I'll make the code available for all of these various functions. So that should simplify. If you want to deploy this yourself, that should help uh, get that off the ground. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is come back to this Gemini Pro press release. Um, and there's a couple links here that tell you how to get started. So if it says if you go to uh, Google AI Studio, you can um, get an API key. And then it gives you this Gemini API cookbook link, which gives you some starter code. So um, I'm going to do the API key second, um, and I'm going to open up the API cookbook first. So if I click this link, uh, it'll open up this GitHub repo. And there's a bunch of stuff in here for different applications. Uh, what we want is under the Quick Starts folder, there's a notebook called um, Video. So you click on that, it'll load the Jupyter Notebook. And inside that notebook, there's a link to run in Google Colab. So um, you can't do anything, you can't interact with it here in GitHub. But if you click on this, it'll open up uh, Google Colab and you can actually run the code. And that's what we're going to do first, just to see what's going on. Okay, so here's the notebook in Colab prompting with video and shows you how to prompt and how to get started with a video file. Um, they have a sample video, which will run first, and then I'll upload the video that we're going to be using to test our app um, later. Um, so the first thing is, um, if you've never used Colab before, it's broken down into cells. Each block across the, the window here is a cell. If you click into the cell, you can click this icon here to run the code, or you can press Control Enter or Shift Enter, and it will run this code. And then what's down here is the output of running that code. So in this case, this action is installing a Python package called Google Generative AI, which we're going to use uh, down below. And so if you've never seen this before, um, this uh, exclamation mark is um, notebook shortcut for run a shell command. So pip is the package installer for Python. So it's how you install additional software to use in your project. And then this is the command that that module is using. Um, dash u means update whatever you're installing and update pip. Dash q means just give me less output for quiet. And then this is the name of the package. So if I press control enter here, uh, you'll get this warning that it was not authored by Google, even though I believe it was. I'm not really sure why that shows up. But anyway, you click run and you should see some output down here. Uh, we could clear the current output um, and it will show us as it installs the package uh, what's going on. So we can leave that alone for now. This next cell is importing that package into our workspace so that we can actually use it. Uh, we can't run this next cell until this one finishes, which will be just a second. Uh, and then down here, it talks about authentication. Um, oh yeah, if you double click on one of these text cells, you'll get the markdown, um, which is what's how it's doing bold and headers and stuff like that, um, but not really important for our use case right now. Um, it's telling us we need an API key. So we have to go back to, um, well, there's different ways to do it, but we can go back to this link here and click on the Google AI Studio link, and it will bring us to the studio. The first time you open up uh, AI Studio, um, you'll get this, uh, this legal notice. You'll have to consent to the terms and conditions, click continue. And then um, you should get a prompt. If you've never used Google AI Studio before, you'll probably get a prompt that asks you whether you want to start using, uh, like prompting the model or whether you want to get an API key. Um, but if you want to get an API key, you can also just click up here and then click this, another terms and service. Um, so here you can say, create an API key in a new project if you don't already have one, which is this, or you can um, look for an existing project. So we don't have uh, a project in this account. So we'll click this and it will generate a project for us and give us an API key. So here's our API key, um, which will be deleted by the time you see this. So we're gonna copy this to the clipboard. We'll come back to our notebook, uh, which is now done installing this um, package. And we should be able to run this and it's completed. Note these numbers here can be helpful um, as you're debugging. Um, the number in brackets is the order of the cells that you've run. 
So I think I ran this one twice just now, which is why it shows three. If I run it again, it should probably show four. Um, yeah, so that's just, if you're trying to debug sort of how you ran your code. Uh, and then down here, um, to get our API key into the, the notebook so that it can use it, if we run this like uh, without changing anything, it's gonna fail. And it will say the secret key does not exist. And it explains how to do this, um, but it's pretty straightforward. You just click on this secrets key, add new secret, and the name of the secret or the name of the, um, well, this is really an environment variable, if you're familiar with that, um, is you plug the name in there and then you plug the value in. Um, actually, now that I've copied that, I've lost this one. So I'll copy that again and I'll paste that in here. And so now we have um, like our API key is stored in this variable. And when we run this, um, it, will, it will load it. Um, it says notebook does not have access to secret name this, grant access, yes. Um, and then if you wanted to print that out, for example, um, an introduction to using Colab, if you click up here, um, you'll get a new code cell. And if you just type the name of the, um, the variable that you wanna see, it'll just print it out. So we can do this and press control enter. And there's our API key from over here. Okay, so that's good. Um, you don't need this cell, you could delete it. So the next is the extract frames logic. Um, and this is kind of the bulk of what's going to be happening in our, in our first pass right here. And you'll notice as we go on that it's much easier to do this in local memory in the context of a notebook than it is um, on a Lambda function, just because you know it's just, it's all here in memory. So you'll see what I mean later if that doesn't mean anything right now. So here we're setting the name of the video file, which is a URL. So it's going to go to this URL, download the file into memory, and then split it up into frames. So down here, this is all of the business logic really um, for getting the frames out. So we'll look at this a little bit more carefully as we go through and port this over to Lambda. But if we run this now, what it's doing is it's importing some packages, it's setting up some variables, like these all caps variables are um, setting the where the frames are going to be extracted and what the prefix is. Then we have a couple functions. This one just creates an output directory if it doesn't exist already. Um, and then this one uh, is really doing the heavy lifting. This is extracting all the frames. And so you can see down here that it's printing um, completed video frame extraction and then however many frames it extracted. Um, at, and then this is running this function with the video file name that we set up here. And then here it's going to say, here's the video we extracted, one frame per second was our FPS. And then here's um, the success message. It extracted almost 600 frames. Now that we have the frames in memory, uh, the next thing to do is to upload those frames to the Google File API. Um, now, I don't know if they're planning to accept um, images that are not uploaded to the Google File API. Um, currently, the limitation is that you can upload individual files that are up to two gigabytes, and your whole project where you created that API key, you can upload a maximum of 20 gigabytes of files. So for lots of projects, this is sufficient. For some projects, it's definitely not. Um, so I don't know if they're gonna change these limits or support file storage in a different manner, but um, something I'm tracking. Anyway, um, what it's going to do here um, is it defines this class of a file object. I mentioned a couple minutes ago that um, the file, the data that we upload um, to query the API is the timestamp in the image URL. That's what this is composing, is that data structure. Um, get timestamp is parsing that out of the frame. Uh, the name of the, the image of each frame it encodes the, the timestamp of the video. And so it's pulling that out for part of the structure. Here, we're just listing all the files that we have um, in that frame extraction directory that we set up. Um, this is just a Boolean. If we change this to true, it'll upload all of the frames, but keeping it as false, it'll only upload a 10 second slice or 10 frames. Um, and then this loop here, is just uploading all of the files to upload from item number 40 to 50, so 10 frames. Um, and then here's our success message. So if we run this now, it'll start uploading the frames that we've extracted. Um, that's what this output is telling us, that it's uploading it to the Google File API. And that'll just take another couple seconds. And then um, once that's done, we can run this block here, which just lists the files that we have um, up, just uploaded to the File API. And so if we click on this URL, we actually get a warning that we're not authorized to view it. Um, so 
this output isn't super useful in the notebook, but um, you, you're going to want these URLs later when you're um, storing your data. Okay, so now we've we've uploaded a video, we've parsed all the frames and uploaded those to the file API. Uh, the next thing to do is compose these um, this data structure that has the uh, the timestamp and the data about the file. So it has the file URI and the the type of file that it is. So the next block of code is just going to take those frames and create this data structure using this class that was defined uh, right here. So what we're going to do in this block here is we're going to set our prompt, just describe this video, uh, pretty generic. We're going to set the model, um, which is just an object from the um, this SDK that we installed up above. So when we install this uh, and then import it as gen AI, um, one of the objects, uh, one of the classes that we can instantiate is this model. So we do that. Uh, and then the make request function is going to take first, it's going to include our prompt in this list of data. And then for each file in those 10 files that we um, chose here, it's going to um, add to this array, uh, the timestamp, which is this, and the file uh, dot response, which is this. So then this line here composes our request body using this function. And then our response, we're going to make, we're going to actually make our API calls. So this generate content function um, is part of this uh, model object that we instantiated. And we send over this request that we built and this request options, it's just saying if it takes more than, I think this is 600 seconds, um, maybe it's 600 milliseconds, I'd have to double check that. Um, then we get our response down here. So if we run this, um, it'll compose our request, send it over and we'll get something here. A large grumpy rabbit wakes up and comes out of its den. And so that's basically the end of the prompt chain. So what we could do is we could change our prompt and we could say something like, what animals are present in this video? And we should get a different response, assuming everything is working. The animal present in the video is a rabbit. We could say, you know, whatever we want here, are there any foxes in this video? And if we run this, hopefully it'll say no. And so hopefully this starts to give a sense of what kind of things you can do with this, um, with this API, right? You can start to interact with um, all this data uh, in the frames. And then the last thing in this notebook is just delete files. So if we run this code, um, it will delete all the files that we just uploaded to the file API. And the reason you might want to do that is because of the file limitations I mentioned above, the 20 gigabyte limit. Um, it also will say somewhere in here, I think, yeah, files will be deleted after two days and you can't download them from the API. So um, it's not like a bucket like on AWS S3 or GCP where you can just store data for whatever use case. Um, it's a temporary storage for this kind of application. And one last thing I wanted to do before we move on from this actually is upload our own video to see if uh, it will work on our own data. So I've got this video from YouTube. This is a famous psychology experiment um, where um, people are passing a basketball back and forth and the, the participants are told to count how many times the people in the white shirts pass the basketball. And the, the sort of funny thing about this is that a gorilla walks by um, in the middle of the video and this is a famous psychology experiment because lots of people didn't notice this gorilla. Uh, it's impossible to miss it if you know it's there, but if you don't know it's there, you know, you might overlook it. So what we're going to do is upload a chunk of this video uh, without the, you know, the beginning text and the end text, just the chunk in the middle and see if the, um, the model can actually detect how many times the basketball was passed, which is 15. Um, so if we come back to our notebook, the way you upload files is you come here to this icon on the left and you click upload. And I've got this video here, selectiveattention.mp4. It'll give you this warning that you're, when you shut down your notebook or when you close this tab, the files will be deleted. So it's not a long-term storage solution. Um, and so our data will pop up. Once this blue circle is done, um, our video will be available for us to use. Now it's being uploaded as selective underscore attention.mp4. And so it will tell you up here that if you want to use your own video, what you want to change is the file name. So here, this gives you an example of how to upload files. Um, but what we can do is just change the name here. Um, SelectiveAttention.mp4. And when we set this, then we need to rerun the code from before. So we need to extract the frames, upload them to the file API, and then finally query against that. So it's good practice, I guess, to go through this a second time. Oh, and I made a typo in the, uh, the name of the file. And so I got an error when I ran the code. Um, if I run this now, it should work. Yeah, so it's extracting at one frame per second. 
Um, I think the clip I extracted was 20 seconds or 30 seconds, um, so this shouldn't take too, too long. Yeah, there we go, 26 frames. And so now we can upload these extracted frames to the file API. I'm going to change this uh, Boolean here from false to true so that it uh, uploads all of the frames, all 26 of them, I think it was. Um, and so then down here, we should see that it's uploading our frames and this will take five, 10 seconds. Okay, so now this is done, took a little bit longer than that, maybe 30 seconds. Um, now our files are up, available on the file API. Uh, if we run this, we should see, um, I don't think I ran the deletion cell, so we should probably see all of the files that we've uploaded. Um, there's our list of files. Now generate content, we wanna change this prompt to how many times, how many times was the basketball passed? Um, now this might fail actually because the frames per second that we're extracting is fairly low. Um, so it says it passed the basketball or the, ba the players wearing white passed the basketball four times. So I'm gonna really quickly run through this again at a higher frames per second rate and see if this works better. Okay, so to increase the frame rate and uh, extract more frames from your video, um, we actually have to modify the code. Um, so I thought we could just change a couple of parameters here in this original code, um, specifically the uh, frame duration and the FPS. So the I've added a few print statements here to the original code, but this frame duration was originally set to um, just the frame rate of the video or the FPS of the video. Um, and then down here, this is the original block that would say that um, sort of every time we get to that FPS marker, um, pop out a frame and save it. And so I tried playing with this. I thought that that would be enough, um, but it turns out it's not for a couple of reasons. Um, number one, you can you can make a couple of these tweaks and pull out more of the frames, but the problem is the, the timestamp, the way that that is appended to the end of the name of the file of the image um, is coded here with the expectation that the um, what we're outputting is a minutes and seconds block, which is what the spec says down here, um, that this is what our timestamp looks like right here. So um, like hour, hour, colon, minute, minute. Um, the problem is if you want sub-second resolution, so you want more than one frame per second, um, you need to add an additional field here um, onto your, um, your timestamp. So I, um, using the help of uh, another large language model, I took this code and rewrote it, um, which I'll share in the associated um, repo, that, the GitHub repo that I'm gonna share with this video. But basically we um, make the timestamp, this is the upload function, we make the timestamp calculation um, use the full resolution of the, of the video, the temporal resolution of the video, and then the FPS, um, or sorry, the timestamp that gets appended to the end of the name uh, uses that rather than this assumption of uh, one second. So yeah, I'll share this code, like I said, but um, what I'm doing now is uploading uh, I extracted 155 frames, so um, it's about six frames per second. Um, I set it to five, but with rounding, um, I guess with the um, the way that the rounding works, this didn't, I would have expected five times 26. Uh, the video is 26 seconds long, so it's 130, uh, but we get 155. I might dig into why that is a little bit later, but in any case, um, extracted these frames, um, and now we're uploading them here. And so you can see the timestamps have hour, hour, minute, minute, and then uh, basically milliseconds or like fraction of the of the second. So like 525 milliseconds. And so now I've uploaded 155 images instead of 26, uh, which are here. And we can come down to the prompt now. We can run this again. And how many times was the basketball passed? We got four initially when we passed over just the uh, 26 frames because there just wasn't enough vis uh, video data to tell how many times the ball moved back and forth. But now that we've increased the temporal resolution of, of, our, um, of our extraction, we get much closer to the correct answer, which is uh, 15 is the correct answer, but it shows 16 here. Okay, so I'm going to cut the video here as the end of part one. And then in part two, we'll pick up uh, taking this code from Colab and, and building a Lambda function that uses it and deploy that on AWS.